Welcome to our Saturday simulcast. I'm joined by Brian Newbert and Tom Deanhart. I want to thank our sponsor, the Purdue Union Club Hotel, the 811 Bistro Boiler Up Bar, for their support of this weekly uh, event. Uh, we appreciate all of you that uh, listen, watch, and, and comment about it as well. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you might like our YouTube page as well. That would be a, a fantastic thing if you do that. A lot going on in our kind of all of our weeks changed, at least from a Purdue University perspective, not necessarily uh, in athletics, but it has something to do with that. Mitch Daniels announcement, uh, the announcement of the transition of Mitch Daniels yesterday afternoon around 1.30 p.m. And that Meng Chang will be taking over as president on January 1st, 2023. Uh, interesting situation to say the least. And obviously, where does it impact uh, Purdue Athletics? Hard to know. They did one thing about the Board of Trustees and Mike Berghoff and company do a great job of keeping things quiet because nobody knew <laughs> that this was going down, or at least not very many people did, uh, which I found that interesting. But uh uh, I'll start with you, Tom, in terms of uh, just your your reaction. And, and uh, we all know Mitch Daniels has been, a, been a, a big supporter of athletics, didn't necessarily start out that way, but uh, it's going to be interesting as Purdue makes that transition. Yeah, just a lot of unknowns right now. And you, you spoke of, I guess, the surprise, uh, like I guess everybody. Uh, I, I was surprised when I saw the stuff on social media, obviously, breaking the news. No inkling. Um, the page is going to be turned, though, obviously. And then, like I said, um, with that comes a lot of unknowns. And with unknowns, there's always some anxiety uh, just because, again, you don't know where, where you're treading into. And from our perspective, guys, that's athletics, right? And you guys have been doing this for a long time. And you all know that everything in every organization starts at the top. I mean, that's, that's where the tenor is set. That's where the tone is set for organizations. And you, you got to have cooperation and want to. Uh, at the very top of your organization. So if you want to be successful, obviously, in Purdue's standpoint, you need a president who's on board with athletics that wants to wants it to really matter, wants to be a significant player in that, in that aspect of the university. So is the new president of that ilk? I don't know. Again, like I said, none of us know. But um, uh, again, uh, it'd be interesting to see as we learn more about this individual, uh, what their marching orders are, and I guess what their goals are, right? I mean, Mitch Daniels, I know he had his detractors, but he did an awful lot of good things for the university during what's going to be a 10-year run. I um, mean, the explosive, the explosive enrollment and growth of the university has been unprecedented. Uh, the tuition freeze, I think that's going to be maybe one thing that he's known for, uh, among his other accomplishments at Purdue, too. So, yeah, I mean, uh, exciting time and an anxious time at Purdue with leadership about to change here in about six months. You know, Brian, one of the things that we talked about, we talked about online, and Board of Trustees obviously direct the uh, president in Meng Chang will have five members of the 10 that are extremely, extremely dialed into Purdue athletics. Obviously, uh, Mike Berghoff, Gary Lehman, Joanne Briette, Sonny Beck, and Mike Klipsch, who Mike is the actual liaison to athletics now. That that will have an impact, but uh, you know your reaction to the transition and the fact that uh, uh, Purdue will have a, its youngest president since 1946, the first time, I think, since 1890, if John Norberg is correct, which I'm sure he is, that Purdue's hired in-house, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which there's been Purdue graduates before, Art Hansen was, but um, just an interesting hire from that standpoint uh, in terms of bringing someone that's been here for five years, very well educated, et cetera, Meng Chang. He uh, graduated from Stanford, worked at Princeton. Uh, his academic accomplishments seem in engineering and other places seem to be many. But uh, uh, what, what say you on this uh, situation, Brian? I think that, you know, we can talk all we want about what the university president's mentality is from an athletics perspective, but, you know, um, presidents do not act unilaterally. Uh, they, right. they, they serve at the pleasure of the board of trustees to a, a significant extent, obviously. Um, and I think that, um, you know, a few years back, uh, Purdue made quite a commitment, you know, to, from an athletics perspective to, kind of elevating itself. They, they dedicated more resources to athletics. They really committed, you know, to kind of playing the game and that that's not really been Purdue's MO through its history. You know, right. Purdue's always been, you know, 
academics and whatnot, first and foremost. And if you think it was Mitch Daniels who drove that commitment to athletics, that, that that's not accurate. I think that, um, yeah. I think that, you know, if this all pays off in the long run, um, I think, you know, Mike Berghoff goes down as the guy who really drove this. And I think that, um, Mitch Daniels, to a certain extent, had to be brought along, had to be convinced, had to be pushed into that, uh, because I don't think that he was that guy who ever, you know, was fully committed to doing what needs to be done to commit, you know, to compete athletically at the highest of levels. I think anybody who read the Washington Post editorial a few weeks back about NIL probably didn't exactly see the most athletics compatible uh, mentality from the man who's been running the university for so long now. Uh, I think that was a good glimpse into the, how he views things. Um, and it's not necessarily, uh, it wasn't necessarily reflective of the sort of mentality that needs to be implemented in order to compete at the level, you know, people want Purdue to compete at. That being said, Purdue has, uh, Purdue again, has always been, you know, first and foremost, an academics place, a, 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 a culture that's not necessarily, you know, sports driven and that that's okay. I mean, that's, that, that's a university's yeah. mission statement. First and foremost, athletics is fun. Athletics is nice. Athletics can do a lot for a university, but a university's first goal is to, is to, um, run effectively to educate its, its, its customer base, so to speak, and to, uh, and to be, to be well-respected in its field, to, to, to innovate things like that. And, that's been Purdue's focus from, you know, the dawn of time. And I, I don't think Purdue's ever going to change into that place where it, it, it's an SEC school where it's, we have to, we have to win at athletics first and foremost, that is our priority, things like that. Um, and I think that, you know, Purdue has enough support for that side of it from its trustees that I think that it's never going to just tap out of the whole athletics arms race, you know, kind of things like that. But I also think that Purdue's mentality as a university, as a culture, isn't going to change in that regard either, no matter who's the president. Why, 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 why can't you be both, man? I, 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 that's BS. You, okay. Is, is Notre Dame a bad school academically? Is Stanford a bad school? Is USC, Florida, Ohio State, Illinois. Well, and, and, well, and Mike Berghoff would say we want to be both. Like, go ahead. Well, that, how, about, how about Michigan? Is Michigan a bad well, academic school? They're paying their football coach five million bucks a year. They're putting a few hundred more million into their stadium. You know, now they're, now the going price for a football coach maybe ten million dollars a year. They're trying. I mean, yeah, they are committing to doing that sort of thing. I can't speak to the history of Purdue University. I can't speak to who it was who first I'm set just a saying tone. You can do both. I'm saying you can do both. Right. And I'm saying Purdue's trying to do that both. argument. Yeah. I'm saying yeah. Purdue's I trying think, to do I both. Think if you I'm also saying, saying that this is an yeah, engineering right. school. This uh, is still, a, there's a lot of good engineering schools out there, man. It's not okay. good as engineering. I'm I, I, just saying this is a, this is a, this goes back generations. This goes back to the very identity of the university. Right, this is not the most sports-driven culture in the world. This is a engineering and science school in the middle of a cornfield whose alums yeah, go east and go west and don't stay here and don't and don't do what what Indiana alums do and start up their law firms and start up their businesses here. They stay here. They give their money to Indiana. They go to the they go to the sporting events, things like that. Purdue has a very unique thing going in men's basketball uh, in terms of the culture of, of Indiana and the importance of basketball on this campus. But outside of that, this is, has never been a place that has been sports obsessed. This has I never been. I understand that, Brian. I've been around Purdue for my whole life, buddy. Yeah. I've seen it. I've lived it. I know it. You're not breaking news, man. I get it. Well, my point is, why does I that have to be like can, that? I, 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 I don't think generations of university identity are just going to change overnight. Um, well, but I would, I, 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 whoever the president doesn't really matter. It's basically what it gets down to. No, right? oh, no, it's, it's no, but because the board, we're, we're, talking, we're talking right now about what Purdue did in 2017, where they driven by Mike Berghoff. Kicking and screaming. No, well, not Mike. Not Mike Berghoff. Mike, no, Mike Berghoff drove this. Mitch Daniels president. was kicking and screaming. Um, yeah. and, that, and that was my point about the importance of the president. My opening comment. 
But but right. Purdue is paying its football coach five million dollars. It's paying its basketball coach three million dollars. It's, it's put all this money into facilities. It's got one of the nicest football buildings in the country because the person behind the scenes who is driving that sort of thing is driving it despite despite historical resistance from the highest levels right. of the university. So we're sitting here talking about how much the university president matters. I'm telling you, the university president since the dawn of time here at Purdue have not been driven by that sort of thing. But I'm telling you, it's happening anyway because the board of trustees is behind it. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't, wouldn't it really help if the, if the president was behind it? Yes. Imagine what getting them if that happened. It, it wouldn't hurt, but what I'm saying is it's yeah. happening anyway. So Yeah, and I, and I would argue in the history of Purdue, it's, you know, Fred Hubby very much behind athletics uh, because he was a, you know, all American Rhodes Scholar, et cetera, a long time ago. And, and obviously, I think Mitch Daniels became that. I think that he did see, I mean, we, we, you can go back and look at the record. When he, when he was hired, he, he really talked a lot about putting a cap on where college athletics needed to be or, or keeping it at a level that was a dull roar. Well, it changed. He had to hire, he was involved with hiring Daryl Hazel. I believe on the, at the end of twelve, or even though he was just about to come in, uh, his his impact was uh, was going to happen. And certainly, you know, Mike Berghoff, I think to your point, Tom has said that time and again. Why can't we be both? Uh, uh, certainly, when Jeff Brom was hired and when Mike Babinski was hired, that was the tone of the you know the press conference was, "Hey, you know, we 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 do want to we do want to be at that level." So it's an interesting deal, and and I, I would agree though that that produced long-term approach and certainly with France Cordova, certainly uh, with Art Hansen and to some extent with, with uh, uh, Jiski as well, Martin Jiski that uh, both, all, they all had to be uh, committed. You know, Jiski is an interesting one because Jiski also comes with that engineering background. Obviously he was the university president before he got to Purdue. Um, yeah, but it's, I, it is going to be interesting to see how it plays out. The president's going to play a role from a face standpoint. Mitch certainly became and maybe ego driven to some extent, but certainly the Mitch Daniels that we saw in the crowd, uh, you know, the fine, fine Mitch, him shooting the t-shirts in the last game. Uh, he liked that. He certainly began to like that uh, being in center stage and being a supporter of big time athletics. So yeah, I, you know, it's going to be interesting. One on that more front. point to make here uh, yeah. real quick, being behind something and being fully committed to something. Those are kind of two different things. Um, I think that university presidencies are by nature political positions. And I think that anybody would want to be associated with a successful operation and everybody sure. would want to be disassociated from something that's embarrassing. And Purdue football was embarrassing. And in a lot of ways, Purdue got shamed into this by what was going on uh, with its, it, its previous football situation. And I think that is part of what drove this. I think that Mitch Daniels was always one who didn't want to be associated with anything that made him look bad, which is the nature of those positions. And I think football was making the university look bad at the time. And I think that was part of it too. So Purdue had to kind of bottom out a little bit um, in order to do what was necessary to get back or to get on um, a more even plane with, with its peers. That said, there's no such thing in parody as parody in college sports anymore. So, um, yeah. but Purdue is trying to do this. Purdue is trying to claim a seat at the table here at the highest levels of competitiveness uh, in, in college sports. And that's, that is, even though Purdue has quite a history, you know, in basketball at least, and has obviously had pockets of success historically in football, that has not been, that is a relatively new development. The, the amount of money Purdue spending uh, in athletics now, it's a hundred million dollar plus uh, operation every single year. Um, they're trying, I mean, that, they are trying to be something more than they've been historically from an investment perspective and things like that. It's just, that is a relatively new thing for Purdue. It's when quick, a quick, quick news flash. Um, there's never been parody in college sports and, and there never will be. There's never going to be parody. I'm not so, saying there is. I'm, I'm yeah, no, I think I think you that it's the, it's probably the, it's the only sport, so much Purdue every can sport do relative to Michigan and Ohio state. In every sport we watch baseball, NBA, hockey, NFL college sports is the most scales or tip the most in any sport. There's, yes. I mean, it's, it's really ridiculous when you think about it. And for yes. anybody to even, even utter that notion 
that there's any semblance of parity. There ever has been a semblance of parity. It's a joke. Right. I, I just said there wasn't parity, but yeah, I'm no, saying I agree. Purdue is doing what it can, to, I think, to, to put itself play. in the best position possible in a situation where you're never going to have the resources, you're never going to have the cultural investment, you're never going to have the following that Ohio State and Michigan are going to have. Um, but Purdue's trying. Purdue is Purdue is Purdue is, is invested in this. Um, it's just a matter of how how much it can um, what kind of level it can actually but, bring itself to with that investment. Right. But they're and trying. I, think I mean they I, are yeah, trying. I also Since think 17, Purdue has been trying. Yeah, I'd also both. think there is there is a fundamental difference between uh especially in football, where they know, like Tom said, and you guys have both said there is no parity. There is it's almost it's virtually impossible. And to be very honest, uh, uh to to compete with the history of Michigan and Ohio State. But they I think what happened in 16 and when when or 15 or 14 or whatever you want to look at with with what happened with Daryl Hazel, it did become an, an embarrassment. And uh, I think Purdue's role is, in, especially in football, is to we're going to damn it. We're going to be competitive. You know, if we're, we're going to do this, we're going to at least be competitive. And that's been at least for the most part under Jeff Brown, Purdue's been been competitive. Though this year they may be able to take it another step. We don't know, but uh, I think that's been a big mantra of, of the group. So I think that, they, um, I think that you know there was. The reason 2017 was such a stark change when Mike Babinski came in and, you know, Purdue started investing financially pretty heavily in athletics. I think they started more than ever spending money to make money, right. uh, treating this more like a business as opposed to a uh, kind of a, a not-for-profit sort of, you know, plucky underdog kind of story um, where, you know, softball and men's tennis were, were sort of – treated largely the same as as football and men's basketball i think the reason that was such a stark contrast was you know under morgan burke obviously purdue was very fiscally responsible that they were very very um prudent and responsible in what they did and i think that's hard to argue against but i think that people who wanted purdue to be more all in than that from a investment perspective needed to understand that if that's not the way the university wanted it that's not the way it would have been done. You know, people, you know, Morgan Burke, I think had kind of a, kind of a dual legacy at Purdue. Uh, and part of that was that people thought Purdue was kind of half-assing it competitively. Um, but I always told people that if Stephen Beering and Martin Jiski and, you know, France Cordova and the early years of the Mitch Daniels era, if they wanted it different, it would have been different because they are the boss. The university president is the boss, but where change was enacted was the board of trustees. Um, and as long as those trustees are involved here, Purdue's never going to, I, I don't think Purdue is going to, you know, change what they've been doing since 2017. I think Purdue has established itself now as a team, that, as a university that's willing to at least do what needs to be done to compete at a certain level of, of, of the college arms race here. Yeah, the, the, and I think that's true. I think the thing that's going to be interesting to watch is, again, as we talked about, the president does have to deal with with uh, NCA related things and how that's going to play out. Uh, obviously, Purdue will have to have a voice there, and that's the president's voice at the at the at the behest of the uh, of the board of trustees. So it's it, it will be a it will yeah. Be but also, part of the university president's job here is to also kind of understand the landscape and right. they're the be- face of this behind the scenes and also to under to know what they don't know. So as right. Purdue's new president comes into this changing landscape with, you know, transfer reform with right. uh, There's you know, the learning for the NCAA with name image likeness, they need to understand what's going on here because if Purdue has to have a say in this, in terms of the, where all this is going and how it should be managed, <clears throat> um, Right. You that's, know, that's, that's called that's called a learning curve. You don't put that. you don't put put you don't put Mike Babinski up there to to say all those things to be Purdue's ambassador there as logical as it would be for the athletics people to be the delegates toward all of that. That's not the way it works. It's the university yeah. presidents. And because it's the university of presidents. Who in a lot of arenas don't really understand this that's why the NCAA is in the situation it's in because you have these academics 
who aren't athletics people necessarily who are legislating how college sports is run. And that's why, you know, the NCAA, Ohio State football competitive landscape is being determined by the president at the University of Albany and, you know, stuff like that. Suddenly the absolute absurdities of the way the NCAA structure is 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 kind of carved out um be that as it may uh I I think it's important for any university president to understand the athletic landscape they may not necessarily love it in some ways um but it needs to be understood as well and, and, and that's, what I understand uh, uh Purdue's new president right. is at least um has a favorable view of athletics. I mean, I, I, I don't know if Purdue's ever going to have, you know, um, Gordon G at, at Ohio state, who was always worried about Jim Tressel firing him. You know, I don't know if it's going to be a tail wagging the dog sort of situation at Purdue, but I don't think Purdue's going to have like an anti-athletics person here. Yeah. However, they did in France quarter of us. So, I mean, yes, I agree with you. And I think that that's where uh, it just, I, I agree. I think it, I think the tone is set by the board of trustees and, and uh, the president's got, and he's got the good thing is he's got, uh, uh, he's obviously a quick study on a number of items. So he's going to have at least six months uh, and then some with, uh, with that. Look, sports, right, just, sports isn't, you uh, know, the most important thing at a university, but I think, um, I think that presidents, would be wise to look at athletics for what it can do for a university. Right. And they do look at what it can mean as, you know, as I think Morgan Burke used to call it the front porch of the university or something like that, where it's kind of what people see about you. I think we can all agree that, you know, Drew Brees had an unbelievable positive effect on Purdue's entire university uh, by virtue of his sheer presence. I think, you know, it, it, it's helpful to a university from a branding perspective when there's a Rondell Moore, when, you know, the, the basketball program's really good kind of things like that. I think the money involved in it, you know, can help the university to a certain extent. I am sure the athletic department would prefer all of that TV money, you know, come their way. Uh, and as I'm sure, um, every athletic department in the country would, but there's money to be made off of this. There's, there's all sorts of branding matters, uh, that can help a university. I think, the higher highest levels of the university would be wise to look at sports as well. This isn't our absolute pri priority. This isn't what defines Purdue as a university, but let's use this to, to elevate the university even more. And I yeah. think there's a balance there that any university president would be wise to understand here. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because I'm a sports guy and it kind of, kind of affects our business, but I think that's just the pragmatic way of looking at it. Everything, every part of the university, look at it like, how can this elevate Purdue University? And I think athletics can really, really elevate Purdue University as it can any university out there. Right, and I, and I think that, I think that's that's true. I want to talk a little bit, uh, and we got a little bit of time left. Tom, you put together the All Portal team, uh, which is on the site this week, which is obviously a big subject matter for athletic in, in all of college athletics. Uh, you had a couple boilermakers on that, uh, Tyrone Tracy, and uh, being one of them. Uh, I also thought it was interesting who you brought together as, as the one the one portal guy on Purdue's roster that you think uh, may that you haven't mentioned, but you kind of under the radar guy. Talk a little bit about that and just just that role of it. We talked offline about how there doesn't seem to be any clearinghouse to know where, what every school Purdue has ten transfers, as you've told told us, but uh, how many transfers are other places? But a little bit about how that was put together and and uh, who, who you think two of the big, Purdue's biggest impact guys are. Yeah, first, um, a subject uh, on another matter is uh, the College Football Hall of Fame, Taylor Stubblefield, Larry Burton on yeah. this 2023 ballot. I want to get that out there. That was news this week. Um, uh, the enshrinees will be announced in January of 2023. I spoke to Taylor Stubblefield right. this week. I spoke to Jim Chaney. I spoke to Greg Olson working on a story. Um, Taylor, you would think it's a matter of not if, but when he gets enshrined, I think. At least that, that's my hope. I mean, that's my belief. I mean, Kreiman, the guy who left college football yeah. as the all-time leader and pass is caught. I mean, his resume is, is, is pretty much on par with most of the guys on that ballot. Um, will it happen this year? We shall see. But that's something for everybody to keep on their radar. Taylor, of course, is doing well. He's going to be in West Lafayette with Penn State as a receivers coach on September 1st. Only the second time he's been back on campus since he left after the 2004 season. 
Uh, yeah, the portal stuff too, Alan. Right, Purdue's got ten portal transfers. It's, it's interesting though. The the, the wide uh, difference in, in portal additions at these Big Ten schools. You know, Iowa's just got one guy coming in. Nebraska's got fifteen. Purdue, of course, like I said, has ten. Probably pretty much on par. I think most schools probably have eight to ten uh, portal transfers. Uh, and yeah, the Boilermakers. I think I'll, I'll have something on the site this week where I break down all ten of the transfers. And what I think is going to be their order of importance this fall. And without a doubt, you know, the guys from Iowa, Tyrone Tracy and Charlie Jones, um, my goodness, I think those guys are going to be front and center from an impact standpoint uh, this fall, if not maybe two of the biggest playmakers on that offense, on that team. Um, so, yeah, I think Jeff Brom um, has done pretty well navigating the portal here. Uh, since he arrived, of course, it was just grad transfers for the first few years. Now we have the guys who are instantly eligible once they transfer. And uh, he's got a nice looking group this year defensively. Of course, Scotty Humpich, the Leo, I think he's going to be very good. And T. Denson, the guy you were talking about, Alan. Yeah. Um, he fell off the radar because he didn't practice this spring. You know, he was here. And some people think he may be the best of the three cornerbacks Purdue has coming in as portal transfers. Um, one is Bryce Hampton from Adams State. The other is uh, a Reese Taylor from Indiana, a guy I like a lot, too. And, of course, T. Denson. All, I think all three of those guys will be factors and really help that cornerback spot when you factor in Corey Trice and Jamari Brown coming back, too. They really replenished that position with some veteran personnel who can get on the field right now. So, yeah, these guys, you know, they, they, they transfer for a reason, Alan, and they don't transfer because they want to sit on the bench. And uh, again, th those are some guys that I think uh, you, you can't anticipate playing big roles this year. I guess, you know, lastly on the transfers, the two guys who are still a bit of an unknown of the offensive linemen. Um, Shione Fina was here this spring from Florida International. He was hurt, didn't really practice much. And then, of course, right. Daniel Johnson from Kent State just arrived on campus offensive tackle. Um I think right now, if, if I was pushed into a corner, I think those guys are probably just backups at this point. Um, but again, they're at the very least, they're veteran backups at a position where the reserves mostly were, were, were red shirt freshman type players. So they, they definitely are going to at least help fill out that depth chart at that key spot. Brian, I'll come back to you on. on... Yes. Hello. Oh, no. We made it this far. Oh, he had a good run. <laughs> let's wrap it. All right, well, let's take it from here, noobs. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the Utah trains. I wonder if he's showing up right now. Like the people who are going to see this on recording, he's actually talking, and now we're we're not. We're frozen. Okay. Um, the Utah transfer would be uh, David Jenkins Jr. He is, uh, uh, I reported yesterday, he is visiting Purdue this weekend. He's one of Purdue's last options here on the guard front. I do think there's some. Now he's gone. He had a good run. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think Purdue does have some other alternatives. I think you've gotten to a point now where, you know, a lot of the guys you really wanted here. Uh, a lot of the guys capable of really taking you from one level to another. I think, you know, some of those ships have sailed. Uh, I think, you know, this, this, this transfer cycle will be remembered as the one where Purdue got screwed by NIL because, yeah. uh, you know, they had their guy, they had the guy mm -hmm. and he got bought um, that being Nigel Pack, obviously. Um, but I do think, you know, there's some other options out there for Purdue to at least bring in. Can you uh, say who, can you say who Brian or not? David Jenkins Jr. That's who I mean, is, is, are there any other ones? I, I guess I guess the way he's phrased that made me sound like there's more in addition to him. I have just kind of some vague idea that there okay. there is somebody out there that would probably be their last resort, um, but I, I don't know who it is. Um, okay, here, here here's one for you. So, what are the odds Jenkins lands at Purdue? Well, you know, I've been playing that game for three months here, and <laughs> I don't know who else is on him. Um, so it, it, they're going to, they're going to turn the lights out of the bar pretty soon. You got to go home with somebody. Yeah. <laughs> not, not the way I'd put it, but yeah, you're right. Um, I think, you know, if, if they can get Jenkins, obviously at, at this point you have to get Jenkins. I think he's wow. a guy who can score. He can give you a little bit of what you don't have right now. I think you need somebody in that backcourt. It's not just about needing a point guard. It's about needing somebody who can score. Hey, look who's back. 
Um, yeah, I lost you. I lost you guys. Okay. Obviously, kept talking. Hopefully, my my yeah. expletive didn't make the make the show. But go ahead, Brian. I'm, you're you're talking, so go ahead. That's good. It's about it's about having somebody who can give you a credible offensive presence to somebody who can who can score, who can shoot, who can you know, kind of put the ball in the basket. I think that's kind of more of David Jenkins' mo than is just being that traditional a starter, uh, sort of point starter? guard. Can he start? I have no idea. Um, I'm this be, this guessing be- he would, you know, be brought in as a starter. I think a lot would depend on Braden Smith, um, mm. too, what kind of position he'd be in. Um, there's something to be said, too, for having a guy who can score coming in off the bench. So even if he's not a starter, if you're able to get him, uh, yeah, I didn't get a little ahead of ourselves here. But um, who, else, who, who else is looking at him, trying to get him, you know? I have no idea. I, I I don't know. I've, I've heard Iowa State might be in there. Uh, Iowa State's probably recruiting every guard in the country right now, um, as is yeah. Purdue. But um, this would be the kid's fourth school. Yeah, I was looking at that bio you posted. San is it South four? Dakota yeah, State. I know he was at South, South Dakota, Dakota State. State or whatever. He was at UNLV. UNLV Utah, I mean, and then he was at Utah. Yeah. But that's kind of the nature of the game now. <laughs> I, I mean, I I don't know if the stigma on that sort of thing is the same right, as it would have been unique. a couple of years ago. No, because, it's just kind of fun. Just a fun fact. Yeah, it's uh. You know, Purdue's had guys before. Sterling Carter played for a couple schools. Uh, Johnny Hill played for a bunch of schools. Those guys were okay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. They'll be but, all right. I hope if they get them, they need to land somebody. Obviously. Yeah. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens. But, um, you know, I, I I remain fairly certain that Purdue's going to get somebody. Uh, they will add a player. I think they have no choice but to add a player. Um, as I said before, I think this transfer cycle will be remembered as, you know, um, mm. Purdue had the guy it needed, had the guy it wanted, had the guy, one of the best transfers out there, and he got bought. And that's just kind of the kind of the nature of this unique time in, in, in NCAA history, but also the fact that this was, happened to be a year where Purdue had the cachet to recruit the best transfers possible, and this just was kind of a kind of a weird convergence of events here. And uh, but they'll get somebody, I think, and uh, maybe it's David Jenkins Jr. We'll see. Uh, but he's he, he's supposed to visit this weekend. Excellent. All right, we were going to talk. We'll do this. Where next were time. you? I don't know. I don't. Know. I think the the internet just shut out in the north side of West Lafayette. I was worried that you know, we lost all everybody. I couldn't even get back. So who knows? I'll talk ready. I'm back to close the show. And I'll do that. But we will also hit on. We've had swoop in to take all the credit for the we show, will. huh? You you can he checks you, out and then he comes back in for the big win. Yeah, you guys <laughs> can we can we can do a talk of what we did on our summer vacation uh, here sometime. A point. What was our favorite summer vacation? I, uh, we'll do that uh, down the road. Yeah, I'm I'm coming. I'm I'm uh, I'm the closer here, I guess. But uh, and I I don't know what happened, but I'm glad I'm glad I'm back. But we want to thank uh, the Purdue Union Club Hotel and also uh, the 11 Bistro. I want to thank Brian Newbert and Tom Deanhart. You know, at least we have lively cons- lively uh, uh, discussion here. It's always. Uh, entertaining oh, thanks, we noobs. Hope it's I'm just trying to liven things up for you noobs I just like <laughs> well it's Tom, funny I had I, I had a like I had Tom a, yells at me it's, yeah. it's I, I had a uh, woman yesterday that was uh, at an event that came up to me that uh, was a subscriber I think she is a subscriber and she well, said no. I just love this show I listen I watch it or listen to it every weekend while I'm doing my Sunday dishes so uh, <laughs> we we think that's a that's a good thing you gotta get well. that you, you, you gotta get a new so promo I, code, I right? like I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually needle pointing right now while you guys talk so just so you guys know so that's that's part of it but Thank you all for watching and listening. We'll be back next week with some entertaining. I don't think we'll have as big a news as the change in Purdue's president, but we may have some other fun things to talk about. We always do, and we'll be we'll be back next week. So have a great week, everybody. Thank you all for watching and listening. As Brian always says, I always can't I can never repeat. It's how you not digest, ingest. What word do you use? It's exactly that. How how you digest, how you ingest. You nailed it. Yes. Um, no, it's ingest. Did digest, ingest. This, our material, we're grateful for that. And my my internet could, remains unstable. As I'm I'm unstable. So that's thank you for watching. Problem. Thank you for and, reading. And, thank uh, you for we'll listening. And thank it. you for processing our materials. However, as you process our materials, there it is. Yeah, put that in your there, tombstone. There you go. That you, you, that you, should be written. That you continue to infringe on my personal brand, carpet.
Yeah. All right. I want that trademarked and, and I'll, and I'll credit you every time. All right, guys, have a great week. Uh, we will uh, again uh, be back next week. Thanks to all of you for watching and listening. Have a great one. Thanks.